But first of all, I'd like to introduce Thomas, our pilot. Thomas has been an awesome pilot, and without mm. his skills and dedication, we would not be here now. In fact, it's been uh, pretty amazing that we've had. But I think since the beginning, 24 flights, uh, 21 of those have actually been survey flights. So starting in Montreal to here, that's what we've done so far. Probably two or three left to, to final completion. Um, I reckon we've covered about 25,000 kilometers when you add it all together. And somewhere between 15 and 20 grand in gas. So that's going to be interesting when we submit those receipts. Um, in terms of surveys, I don't know, I've kind of lost count. <laughs> but we, we've averaged two flights per day. So 12 days so far, 24 flights. Uh, how many hours are we up to? I think we did engines on 72. We collected a lot days. of data. So those of you that are going to be working with this data, or even if you didn't think you would be, you know, there's a lot of opportunities here. There's uh, probably enough data to keep uh, an army of students busy for the next few years. Okay, so what I'd like to do then is just explain a little bit about the, the system and you know why this is state-of-the-art, why it's different to traditional uh, airborne LiDAR system. I guess maybe a little bit of history. Airborne LiDAR has been around commercially for about 20 years, or you could say 30 years if you go back into the real early R&D uh, stages of the technology. But right now, um, it's, uh, it's evolved uh, quite considerably. So now we're dealing with systems that can collect over a million uh, pieces of information a second. Actually, a lot more when you think of all the different types of information. But essentially, a million 3D points on the ground per second. And uh, you know, and those points have got coordinate information. They've got intensity information. So it's kind of like generates a black and white photograph as well as generating that three-dimensional image of the ground surface. Um, vegetation, buildings, all of that kind of three-dimensionality of the environment that we live in. Can't penetrate ground. That's often a question we get is, well, how far into the ground does it penetrate? It doesn't do that. However, one of the unique attributes of this system is that it operates in three channels. So we have two near-infrared channels, uh, 1064, about one micron, one uh, 1550 nanometers, or one and a half microns. So they're both in the near-infrared. Uh, and then we have a blue uh, sorry, a green channel, 532 nanometers, or half a micron. And uh, the, the major difference between the blue channel and the other two near infrareds is that it, sorry, the green channel, is that it can penetrate water. And so that is a really useful attribute. It means that as long as the water is not too turbid, we can measure the depth of the water. So the pulse it hits the water surface, it refracts, it actually bends because the speed of light changes when it encounters that new medium. And so then it angles downwards towards the, the bottom of the, of the riverbed or the lake bed, reflects back to the surface, then refracts again back to the airplane. And so we'll get uh, measurements of, of water depth uh, simultaneous with uh, measurements of the shoreline topography and vegetation. And each of these three wavelengths enable much different characterization. So as we've already mentioned, the, the blue-green is good for water, but the two near-infrareds give us different elements of the, of the uh, Earth's surface. So the one micron laser, for example, is very good for vegetation. We get very good returns over vegetation. Uh, the one and a half micron is very sensitive to water. So if you've got a lot of uh, surface saturation or if you've got wet foliage, for example, then you'll, you'll get a weaker return in the, in the one and a half micron. So each of these wavelengths give you a little bit different information about the, about the landscape. And therefore, when you put them all together, you can generate kind of signatures. As we would with traditional remote sensing, like multispectral remote sensing, we can develop signatures that, that uh, represent different uh, elements or attributes of the landscape. But the really neat thing here is it's active in that it's, it's got its own source of illumination and it's three-dimensional. So it, it's, I, I consider it kind of paradigm shifting in the way we're going to do remote sensing. It's, it's 3D multispectral, so there's a lot of neat things we can do. This particular technology has been around for um, since, since its proto, prototypical uh, version, probably a couple of years now, but I believe only three have been sold. Don't quote me on that, but I think that there's only about three of these out, out there. Um, an optic, Teledyne Optech in Ontario kindly loaned us this system. Um, if we wanted to buy this, in fact I know this because I've just asked for a quote for one, if we wanted to buy this with the current exchange, US-Canadian exchange, it would be about $3 million. I don't know what the airplane is, but I'm guessing we could buy six or seven airplanes for what that laser is worth. <laughs> um, so it, it is state of the art, it's very expensive, uh, lots and lots of data, it keeps us very, very busy. Um, and as you can imagine, we've collected a lot over the last 12 days, we haven't really processed any. Because if we were processing data, we'd still be in Ontario 
dealing with day one's data. So you can imagine the mountain of task that we have ahead of us. It's going to take a while to, to wade through all of this. It's going to be fun, and I'm going to need some of your help with that, of course. Um, so, okay, let's all crowd around a little bit closer. I'm going to climb in and then show you the various components, and then we'll, uh, I don't know, just chat, ask questions. I've seen it lots, so... Right. Do it from here, I guess. Um, and just feel free to cycle around and stick your head in, and then afterwards maybe everyone can just poke their heads in and have a look. But up here, we have um, the operator interface. So we've got a laptop up front. In this particular aircraft configuration, the uh, operator of the system is going to sit facing backwards, and they've got a laptop on a table there, and so that kind of controls this, this whole unit. Um, here we have the sensor head, so the three lasers are in there. If anyone wants to look underneath and have a look, you know, feel free, you can see the aperture. Um, all you'll see is an aperture for the laser and an aperture for a camera. So there's a, I can't remember the megapixel, but there's a high resolution camera in here. I think it's about 65 megapixels. Um, obviously we've got a lot of cables going back here and that joins us up to the control rack. So here we have the power supply for the laser, we have a computer on there that you know basically controls what the laser is doing and we control that from the laptop at the back. So power supply, um, another very important component which is in here uh, is a position orientation system. It's like a GPS on steroids. So it, it's got a, an inertial measurement unit connected to it. The inertial measurement unit, it's like a little can of beans in, in terms of size and weight um, and it measures attitude at very very high uh, repetitions in time and very, very accurately. So that little can of beans, or the IMU, is located in the sensor head as close as possible to the origin of the laser pulse. And so we need to know the offset of the laser pulse origin to that IMU, because the IMU is telling us the attitude of the aircraft in real time. Whether the laser pulse, uh, or the mirror, is where the ranges are measured from. Then, of course, we have a GPS antenna on top of the airplane. So the GPS antenna is giving us the position of the airplane, the IMU, which is down here, is giving us the attitude of the airplane, and then the laser pulse in the mirror, which if you look underneath you'll see the mirror, that's the origin of the range measurement. And those are the three main components, position of the aircraft, attitude, range measurement. Put all of those three, three things together and you can compute the position of the laser pulse reflection at the ground, and you know, it could be a couple of hundred meters or a few thousand meters away. So you've got to make these measurements extremely accurately. And when you're pulsing it up to 900 kilohertz or 900,000 times a second, you've got to be able to do it extremely accurately and very, very quickly. So, <coughs> so this system has three channels. Um, and each one of these channels operates at a range of PRFs. PRF is pulse repetition frequency. So we can operate it relatively slowly, say 25 kilohertz. 25,000 pulses a second, that's pretty slow. Or we can operate each channel at 300 kilohertz. So when you put it all together, that's 900,000 pulses per second. That's pulses. For each one of those pulses, we can make four range measurements. Or we can collect the full waveform. Now, not everybody knows what that means. We're not going to get into it right now. But the full waveform is the full time integrated reflection or reflection response. So over a forest canopy, for example, you could have. 40 or 50 meters of individual measurements along that waveform. You could have more than 10 uh, measurements of foliage within that uh, canopy bed. So think about that, almost a million pulses, maybe 10 measurements per pulses. There's potentially 10 million three-dimensional measurements. And then you also have intensity associated with that in three channels. So it's an incredible amount of data that you can collect with this, right? The question I have, so mm -hmm. did you did you write uh, all these three channels? Did you digitize all this? On the Unfortunately, no. That was a question I asked. Um, this box at the top here is a digitizer. Uh, I don't use it a lot, simply because it collects an insane amount of data. The uh, it, It's hard to give a ballpark number, but on any given mission, we're probably collecting somewhere between 20 and 50 gigabytes of images, just photos. And then, actually a similar amount, but say 30 to 70 gigabytes of range data. Range is just the raw distance measurement 
um, uh, data. The position orientation, the attitude and GPS actually isn't that big of a deal. You know, maybe a couple of hundred meg, which is kind of trivial. Uh, the range data is the, the big one uh, normally. But when you add the digitizer on there, you increase that volume by more than an order of magnitude. So if we had, let's say, a, a 10 gigabyte uh, range file, we'd have at least a 100 gigabyte digitizer file. Oh, and three channels, right? Or per channel? Per channel. Per channel. So per channel. 300 gigabytes. Yeah so, yeah, so it's not one order of magnitude. It's one order of magnitude times three. It's, it's, a, it's a heck of a lot. If we were trying to collect three digitizer uh, channels, we would be, well, just spending all the time downloading. In fact, uh, I was in a bit of a rush to get to the airplane this morning because I was still backing up the data from last night. Thomas and I got in at, I guess, about half past two-ish last night, and then I set the downloads and decodes going, and I was worried it wasn't going to be finished by the time I had to come to the airport. So it's, it's a time-consuming process. So if we were digitizing three channels, we wouldn't be leaving here today. It's as simple as that, because you don't want to leave until you've got everything downloaded and backed up. Um, and, and of course, that's why we haven't processed all the data. Now, what else can I say about this? Uh, okay, so during the operations, there's a number of things we have to do. So remember, we're set up front. Um, Thomas will get the engines going. Once the engines are going, then we can have survey power. So that now gives us power to turn on our um, instrumentation. Uh, these breakers, uh, are, well, they're supposed to be off, but anyway, the breakers are usually left on. And there's a breaker for, for the digitizer as well. Um, so as soon as we get survey power, we see these little lights telling us that power is coming to the system. And they will turn on the system here, we'll turn on the camera here, and we'll turn on the digitizer there. So that's the first thing the operator will do, is turn all of those things on. So now this is starting its boot up sequence. You want to do that because it takes a while to boot up. Um, then you'll turn on your laptop. First thing you're going to do is you're going to open communication with the POS. That's the GPS IMU system. So those of you that have done GPS survey with me, we have to do exactly the same thing here. We've got to initialize that GPS. We've got to collect a lot of data with the GPS before we even go out and start doing survey. So it takes time to do that. Um, so we'll sit on the ground for a few minutes, three to five minutes, just collecting static data. But now one thing with the, the, the position orientation that's a bit different with this system relative to just a standard like PPK type survey is that um, we need attitude, right? And we need to know the pitch roll and heading of the aircraft very, very accurately. So that comes down to the IMU. So once we've initialized the GPS, we also need to initialize the IMU, the attitude. But if the airplane's static, the IMU is not really very busy. And some of you, I think, took the 4850 course with me. You might remember us talking Kalman filters. Again, we're not going to get into that right now. Very sophisticated technical stuff that I don't even really understand. But anyway, you can imagine in real time, a Kalman filter has been applied. So it's going through a lot of mathematical integrations on the IMU in all three axes, X, Y, and Z. And it takes time. And, but if the airplane's not moving, it can't do those integrations. So in order to get a solid fix on your head, well, pitch and roll is quite easy, but heading is always difficult. Um, so in order to get heading, you've got to move around. The airplane's got to move around. And so it's kind of funny, actually. Once we've about five minutes of static, um, I'll ask Thomas to start moving the airplane around and we start doing figure of eights. And I think anybody watching us probably thinks the pilot's drunk. <laughs> But it's actually a very, very important part of the survey. So we, we called that eight. flight of the bumblebee, eh? It is. Like, just we're just like little bumblebees, bumblebees going around. It would be great <laughs> to see it from overhead. So anyway, when we've done that, then we're ready to go fly. So it, it'll tell us on our laptop that we've got something known as final line. <laughs> final line just means that the Kalman filter has converged and, and the, the attitude measurements have got to an acceptable level, level of uncertainty. So when we get that, then we can go fly. And so then we go fly. Um, but the operator's uh, job obviously still continues. We uh, have to load a, a, a survey plan. And but then we have a pilot display at the front that essentially is our mode of communication with the pilot. I mean, obviously we're talking all the time, um, but the pilot display um, allows the pilot to see exactly where we need to be, like to within a meter, in fact, to within 10 centimeters. And I've got a photograph. I've got a photograph of Thomas absolutely sniping the line. This guy's a sniper. Uh, what was it? We were like 10 centimeters offline, so he could have yeah. done better there. 
Um, we were exactly on 1,000 meters above ground level, like exactly, vertically, and I think we were two knots off the pace. You know, we were doing 148 when I wanted 150, so he's still got a bit of work to do. <laughs> but you can imagine trying to move this beast through the air. You're trying to keep on a line, you're trying to keep it level, and you're trying to move at a certain rate. It ain't easy. I've tried to do it. No, I can't do it. It's really hard. So, uh, it, very impressive flying, Thomas. Thank you. If I made a comment that, uh, like, the appropriate uh, water level should be like 50 meters normally, which is acceptable, kind of. No, and, no, I don't accept plus, that. Don't. No, we got uh, to be. And then plus <laughs> minus 10 is kind of excellent. So one meter is like amazing. Yeah. Thing, so that's almost impossible. No, it was very, very uh, hard to do. And actually, last night we were flying around Calgary, right downtown. Our survey lines were over the bow and the elbow. So we had to contend with the buildings. We were flying at 400 meters, and the buildings were 500 feet below us, maybe sometimes a bit less, but anyway, we are pretty close. And then, we're, at the end of our lines, we're coming into the approach to Calgary International. That's why we did it at you know, midnight, between midnight and 2, 2 a.m. Um, sometimes that's just what you got to do to get the job done, so uh, that was a good mission. Then, um, okay, so we've done the mission, we've collected data. Then at the end, we've got to collect all of these files. So the GPS and the IMU files will actually download in real time. So while we're moving out of the zone, we'll start downloading all of those data. And hopefully by the time we get on the ground, we've just got to wait for the last file. We do another static. Now here's another unique thing about the way we process the, the position data for these, is we do a forward and a reverse calibration of the trajectory. The trajectory is just our position through time. And um, when you're doing a, you know, a static survey on the ground or a PPK, post-process kinematic survey, you know, stop and go, you know, you're collecting points with the staff, you might not think too much of um, how the data are processed in the computer, but strictly speaking, you're processing forwards and backwards in time. So you initialize at the beginning, and then you go do your data collection, but strictly speaking, you should also initialize at the end so that the software can process backwards in time. We have to do the same thing here. So when we uh, initialize a survey, we do that static, and we do the kind of figure eights to get the heading, we really should do the same thing in reverse so that the processing can be as accurate as possible uh, in reverse. And, and when you actually process the data and you watch it, you can see it. It'll process forwards, and then it'll process backwards, and you can actually see the, uh, the accuracies improve as you go uh, both ways through. So it, it's kind of neat. But I think the one thing that, that really makes it meaningful is if you operate this, and you process the data, then you kind of understand stuff. If you only operate and you never process the data, it never really makes a lot of sense. If you only ever process and you never operate, a lot of things don't make sense. But when you do the two, the whole thing makes so much more sense. And it's, it's kind of fun to be able to do that because then you know when you're operating, well, what can I get away with? You know, so it, it's, it's good to do that. Okay, I've given you a very brief tour of the system. Please, questions?